to Luke chapter 1. We're going to start in Luke chapter 1 this morning. Luke chapter 1 is where we'll begin. Thank you to everyone this week who spent so much time here at the church decorating and getting everything ready. You all did an amazing job and uh, making all the facilities here look beautiful and amazing. And thank you so much for your hard work and dedication, as well as thank you all for those who worked so hard for Santa's workshop. Santa's workshop is next Sunday, right after church. And if you have children, Santa's workshop is a great opportunity for you to drop off your kids for a few hours. And they get to make some amazing Christmas presents um, for you, for grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, brothers and sisters, neighbors, friends. Um, each child next Sunday after church that's a part of Santa's workshop, all you have to do is sign up for it. The cost is $5 a child with a maximum of $10 per family. It's a great opportunity for you to leave them here while... Um, Santa does a little shopping, or um, you're able to leave them here while they are, uh, spend some time with the other kids. Um, but we still want to have a few volunteers to help out with that. And there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board in the hallway. If you'd like to help out with that, um, you can sign up to be a part of that. This morning, we're going to take a look at a few scriptures. Um, if you would, put your finger in Luke chapter 1, and then also turn to Isaiah chapter 9. <clears throat> I'm going to have you use three fingers this morning. One for Luke chapter 1, one for Isaiah chapter 9, and the other is Matthew chapter 1. We're going to look at a few scriptures this morning. There's about eight other scriptures, but I won't make you use all of your fingers in one toe this morning. Um, we'll look at these scriptures. As we begin this Advent season with the candle of hope, Bob and Sandy came up and they lit this first candle, the candle of hope. And this year, on the four Sundays of Advent, and then as we light this last Christ candle on Christmas Eve, as we celebrate communion here at uh, Rock Christian Road Church of God, we'll light these candles and we'll talk about the meaning of each one of these candles. And this Sunday is the candle of hope. And we recognize the hope that God gave to the world through prophecy and through the fulfillment of that prophecy. So we'll look at Luke chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 9 and Matthew chapter 1. But this hope that God gave his people fulfilled the prophecy of God promising that he would send a savior. He would send a Messiah. He would send a deliverer to the world to right the wrong that took place in the Garden of Eden. And for all of this time that happened before the birth of Christ, all the way back to the the, the original fall in the Garden of Eden with uh, Adam and Eve. This is God preparing the world for this moment that we celebrate at Christmas time. Hope. Jesus is the hope of the world. If you catch nothing this morning, catch that. Jesus is the hope of the world. And this hope invites us to look forward ahead. We look forward in hope to Jesus' second coming. Those before us, before the birth of Christ, look forward in hope to the birth of their Savior and their Messiah, their Deliverer, their King, their Prince of Peace. They were looking forward in anticipation of that. They were filled with hope. And think that it was entirely appropriate, appropriate, if we think about that for just a few minutes, that Jesus was the one. Of course, we know that God orchestrated all of those events, and we'll look at those this morning. But how appropriate that this baby was born, and he looked back at the eyes of the one who did not conceive him, but yet carried him in her womb. This baby, have you ever held a baby in your arms? And just looked at that baby and thought of all of the possibilities that lie within that child. Imagine those possibilities that were running through Mary's mind and Joseph's mind that first Christmas morning. As they looked back into the eyes of Jesus, knowing 
what had been prophesied about this king and all the possibilities that lie within this little baby. Mary had even more maternal pride than any other mom that had been up to that point or any other mom that has been since that point. Knowing of the prophecy that the angel Gabriel came and gave to her in Luke chapter 1, verse 31. You will be with child, the angel said, and give birth to a son. And you're to give him the name of Jesus. You see, Jesus' name was chosen well before he was ever conceived. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And then if you'll flip over to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. The promise to Mary was also echoed here in the prophecy of Isaiah. Seven centuries before the birth of Christ. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful. Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over His kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Not only those two prophecies, but God also spoke to Joseph, to, to Joseph, Mary's fiance. Flip over to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. We thank you for these prophecies that were given. We thank you, Lord, for the word that you gave through the prophet Isaiah, that you gave directly to Mary and Joseph through an angel. That your son would be born, not conceived of man, but conceived of the Holy Spirit in Mary. That he would be born to save the world from their sins. To give the world hope. And I just pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would speak hope and peace to each and every one of us here today. That you would show us that you truly are the hope of the world. And for those that have situations or circumstances in our life that seem hopeless, I pray that here today, on this last day of November, this first day of Advent of this year, we would find hope. Hope in you. We ask all of this in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. I chose those three scriptures to share with you at the beginning of the message this morning because I wanted you to see that God is making it very, very clear that Jesus was the one. There's not another. There's not somebody else. It's not Jesus plus somebody else. There's not another great prophet that's out there. God is making very, very clear through the scriptures and through prophecies and through the message of the angel to Mary and the message of the angel to Joseph that this is the child. There's not another that this Jesus that was born to Mary and Joseph that's been written about more than any other birth in the history of the world. This is the one who was born to bring hope and the Savior of our sins to this world. This baby, God is saying, is the one that you have been waiting for. In that few centuries of silence where God has chose not to speak to his people, in that time, they were still searching. They were still praying. They were still looking for their king. 
But all of a sudden, after a great period of silence, God speaks to his people and he says, I'm sending your Savior now. Your Messiah, he's here now. The Deliverer, the one that will wash away your sins, the Wonderful Counselor, the Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, this is him. He's the one that you've been looking for. And God has made it abundantly clear to us in Scripture that Jesus is the one. And what joy must have filled Mary and Joseph's hearts as they were gathered in a stable looking at this one that the Holy Spirit gave to the world. What hope they must have had knowing that this child was that one that the angels spoke about. This child was the one that fulfilled all of the prophecies that had been given up until this point that his birth would be at this time. It was probably almost overwhelming for Mary and Joseph to think about that awesome responsibility that they had been given as a, as a, as a father and a mother to bring this child, not just any child, but the Christ child into the world. We all know the song, Mary, Did You Know? And that's a great song, and it's a beautiful song. Um, but Mary, did you know, asking that question, absolutely. She knew because she had been spoken to by an angel. She had been reminded of the prophecies that had been given. So there is no doubt that Mary knew that this is the one. Why? Because God has made it abundantly clear to the world that this is the one. And so as Mary and Joseph looked back at this child that had been given to them, not out of their own doing, but out of the Holy Spirit's doing, they knew. And they knew that this child was the one that God had chosen to bring hope into the world. And I mentioned all of that to say this. We are the only religion in the world that offers hope. There's none other. There's none other that can fill it, fulfill hope. There might be others that say you have to, they're the only ones that offer hope. But they can't fulfill that promise. They can't fulfill that hope that you're looking for. It's a faith that hopes for our future. We think of Jesus being born into this world. And it was true for those before the birth of Christ that were searching for the Messiah to be born. They had hope that the Messiah would be born. And so it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It was true for Mary and Joseph as they had gone through all of this, this, this nine months leading up to this and, and this prophecy that had been given 700 centuries before as Mary and Joseph were hoping for this birth, here came this birth. They were hoping for this. It's true for us today as we hope and look for the second coming of Jesus Christ to take us out of this world to where he has gone to prepare a place for us as he told us in the book of John. It is a faith that hopes for the future. It is, it is, now that does not mean that Christianity and our relationship with Jesus is not relevant for today. That's, that's not the case and not what I'm saying at all. It means that the here and now, though, is not our only focus. This moment of November 30th of 2014 is not our priority. It is not what we are looking for. We are looking for, we are hoping and we are trusting in the return of Jesus Christ where he comes back to take us to live with him for all of eternity. Colossians 3, 1 through 2, it says, 1 and 2 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, not on things below, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So our priority, our focus, is not the here and now. We're focused on the kingdom of God, which He has prepared for each and every one of us. Our focus is on His kingdom that He has prepared. Our focus allows us 
to look towards the future, but yet still live in the here and now today. And to live in the here and now today in the fullest. Now that would be the end of the sermon. If hope was so easy to come by. That would be the end. We could close our Bibles, put away our notes, take our stuff and we could go home. If all we had to do is hear some good words about hope. But hope isn't so easy to come by. It's those moments where we sit alone that the devil wants to tell us how hopeless we really are. It's those moments where we sit and look at the circumstances. And it seems that our circumstances are so much bigger than our God. Our circumstances are bigger than the hope that God has put inside of us. Hope contradicts the world's way of living today. I know that each and every one of us has faced circumstances that absolutely seem hopeless. It might be just one phone call that you get. It might be just one letter that you get in the mail. It might be just a few words that the doctor has said to you. When all of a sudden, all of the hope that you ever had seems to be lost forever. How do we get by when circumstances seem bigger than the hope that is within us? There is one way and one way only. And that is if we put our hope in God and God alone. If we trust in Him for help. If we trust in this one who came to bring hope into the world, if we hope in him, the hope of the world, then we can truly find hope. If we go to God first, then we will find hope. But yet so many of us still want to look for other sources of hope. Whenever we have a financial need, what do we do? We go to the bank. We look to the bank for hope. We look to the stock market for our hope sometimes. Or maybe it's not the bank. Maybe it's a rich uncle. Or maybe it's this. Or maybe it's something else. When in reality, instead of going to those sources, we should go to the source of true hope. Or maybe it's sometimes a relational need that we, that we have. But what do we do when we have those needs? We go out and we buy a book on relationships. Or we try to find a marriage conference that we might need to go to. Or we try to find all these other sources for hope, whenever hope is not found in those things, it is found in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. So many times we try to find other sources to fill the void of hope that we do not have inside of us. And that is completely backwards. These prophecies, these angels' messages have told us that hope is not in the world. Hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. Psalm 33, 16 through 22 says this. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him. On those whose hope is in his unfailing love. To deliver them from death and keep them alive in times of famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help. He is our shield. In Him alone our hearts rejoice. For we trust in His holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. What's the psalmist saying? Is the psalmist saying there that a king should not have great armies? <clears throat> That's not what he's saying. The psalmist is saying it's okay to have your great armies. But when it comes time to put hope in something, you cannot put your hope in those great armies. You must put your hope in God and God alone. The armies, the psalmist says, is not going to save you. It will be God who saves you. What has happened to our country? We have failed as a country, as a nation, in putting our hope in God. Those before us put their hope not in the armies. They put their hope not in 
their skills. They put their hope not in the financial resources they had. They put their hope in God and God alone. And when we move our hope to physical things, then we truly become hopeless. What has happened in our country is we've become hopeless. We've lost our hope because we look to other things instead of the hope of the world that we celebrate here by lighting this candle of hope. Psalm says, his eyes are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them. Because there he becomes our help. He becomes our shield. You know what a shield does? It protects you. It guards you. It keeps anything from coming in contact with you. And so the psalmist is saying, if you really want that, then you have to look not at your armies, O great king. You have to look to God. You have to look to the Lord for your hope. Now, I'm not saying you don't go to the doctor when you're sick. I'm not saying that, that the bank isn't going to provide a financial time of help for you when you need it. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying we don't put our hope in those things. Our hope is not in the doctor. Our hope is not in the bank. Our hope is not in a rich uncle. Our hope is in the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Our hope is in the one who is the ultimate healer. We put our hope in those things knowing that God will use those other physical things to bring about a true sense of peace and hope for the world. Our hope should be in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. So here's the real question. Here's the question for us on November 30th, 2014 today. What is the real question? The real question is, when you're in a situation and your hope is running low, where do you go first? When you have no hope, your hope is running low. It seems like you're at the end of the road. Where do you go? Where do you go for your source of hope? Is it the banker? Is it the doctor? Is it a resource book where you can read about what the Bible is really saying to begin with? Or do you go to God first? Is God always the one you cry out to first? Or is it getting on the phone or getting on the internet and finding hope somewhere else? Where do you place your hope whenever your hope is running low? Where does the process of prayer fit into the picture whenever you have no hope? Whenever it seems like you're at your wit's end, where does prayer fit in the picture for you? Where does reading the scripture fit in the picture for you? Is it first? Is it last? Is it never? Where do these resources that God has given us to find true hope, where does it fit into your search for true hope? Can I guarantee if you put your hope in God, nothing bad is going to happen? Can I guarantee that there are not going to be things that come your way that want to disable you or want to cripple you even more or make it seem like things really are hopeless? I can't write that guarantee. I can't write that check and you can't cash it. But what I can guarantee is that if you put your hope in God and God alone, God will prove himself faithful to you. Never. Has there ever been a time that someone has put their hope in God that he has failed? Never. God will always, always, always prove himself faithful. He will never disappoint you. Listen to these scriptures right quick. Isaiah 49, 23. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Lamentations 3.25. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him. To the one who seeks Him. Psalm 147.11. The Lord delights in those who fear Him. Who put their hope in His unfailing love. So where does this hope come from? Where is the source of this hope? Let's be real for just a moment. 
It's one thing to say, I put my hope in God. But it's another, to, another thing to actually do it. We can say to ourselves, and we can buy into the lie that we tell ourselves sometimes. My hope is in the Lord. My hope is in the Lord. But yet, meanwhile, we're over here trying to work up something on our own rather than relying on God and His strength alone. Where do we get the faith that we need to deep down in the depths of our souls? Where does the faith come from to give us the strength to put our hope in God, in God alone? Romans 10, 17 is the key. Listen to this. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Faith comes by by hearing the word of God. And when you don't have enough faith to put your hope in God, you need to hear the word of God. When you don't have enough faith to trust God first, <coughs> instead of somewhere else <coughs> later on, you need to hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, the scripture tells us. And I'm, I'm not saying that you've got to come here every single Sunday morning, every single Wednesday night, and you've got to be here constantly so you can hear the Word of God. But what I am telling you, that in here are the words that God has spoken to us, and this is what you need to hear. I don't care where you hear it from, as long as it is the truth, this is what you need to hear. You need to hear the Word of God because it is hearing this that allows us to have enough faith to put our hope in God. When we turn to those other resources, when we look to the banker and put our hope in him, when we look to, to uh, relationship books or when we look to counselors, we look to all those other things for our hope, we need to go back and hear the word of God. Because Romans 10, 27, or 10 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing the word of God. And when you don't have enough faith to put your hope in Him, you need to hear the Word of God a little bit more. Romans 15, 13 says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Can I give you hope? Uh-uh. Romans says it is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do when you hear the word of God? He comes into your heart. He comes into your soul and he convicts you. He continues that molding process that God began when you got saved of making you into the person that he wants you to be. We can't change ourselves. Romans tells us that it is the Holy Spirit that does that. And how does the Holy Spirit do that? By hearing the word of God, we get more faith. Faith comes by hearing, and when we hear, the Holy Spirit changes us, and that allows us the strength and the faith to put our hope in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. So what does the world need to hear? The world needs to hear Genesis to Revelation. The world needs to hear that their hope comes by hearing. Their faith comes by hearing, and their faith then leads them to Jesus Christ to put their hope in them. So why are you here this morning? There's one reason I believe that you're here this morning. I know that God ordained every one of you who would be here. God knew you would be here. God knew exactly who was going to sit in these chairs this morning. God knew exactly who would hear this message. God knows who will hear this message whenever it's uploaded to YouTube, whenever it's uploaded to YouTube, because they need to hear, you need to hear that the hope of the world can only be found when you, every single one of you, take the word of God to the world. We all, every one of us, have been called to deliver the word of God to a world that is lost and hopeless. So why are you here this morning? Because God wants you to hear that the world will only find hope Whenever you take it to him. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. How will they know? How will those that are lost know? Unless we take this to them. They won't. They won't. And so the world will remain hopeless. Our country will remain off track and without hope until we go tell them. And I hope and pray that it starts 
right here this morning that a great revival in Crystal River, a great revival in Citrus County begins right here today. A great revival in Florida, the United States, the Northern Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere, and everywhere from the North Pole to the South Pole. It begins here today because a group of about 100, 120 people heard that the world needs hope. And hope comes whenever we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And faith alone comes by hearing the Word of God. And so today, as you leave here today, what do you have to do? You have to find somebody that doesn't have hope. You have to find somebody this Christmas season that has no clue what the hope of Christmas is all about and take the Word of God to them. Why? Because they need hope. And just as Jesus came to bring hope, He came to anoint every single one of us to take this message to a world that is hopeless. So this morning, I ask you one question. Where is your hope? Where is the hope that is within you placed? Is your hope on the banker? Is your hope on the doctor? Is your hope on counselors? Is your hope on a bunch of different books that you can buy about what the Word of God says? Or is your hope in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone? Is your hope in something that is going to burn with fire whenever this world is destroyed by fire? Or is your hope built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness? Where is your hope this morning? Because until we put our hope 100% on Him, there is no way in the world that this world will ever find true hope because it starts with you right here this morning would you stand with me father we come to you this morning and we place our hope on you the basis for all of our hope is in you and you alone we come to you, Lord, today, and we say that absolutely nothing else matters today. We're not worried about what somebody's going to say to us. We're not worried about what others people are going to, other people are going to think. We're not worried about what the doctor says. We're not worried about what our boss says. We're not worried about what our neighbor says. We're worried about you and you alone and our hope being in you, our King of kings and Lord of lords, as was prophesied for centuries and centuries and centuries before your birth. God, today I pray that you would build up a hope inside of each and every one of us because we have heard the preaching of your word. I pray, God, that that hope that you build up in us where we turn to you first, not later on somewhere in the equation, not last, Maybe not never, but that hope that you have built up inside of us would be built up so much and you would build up our faith that we would be able to take your hope to a lost and dying world that is completely hopeless. God, I just pray and ask that you would move powerfully through your Holy Spirit right now in this place. That you would anoint us, you would convict us, and you would tell us if we don't have our hope in you. Don't let us fool ourselves here today. Don't let Satan lie to us here today, but let us look solely at you in this closing song, Lord. And you would tell us, you would convict us, you would draw us closer to you and tell us if our hope really is in you or if it isn't. Speak to us, Lord. Convict us, Lord. Let our hope always be in you. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord delights in those who fear Him, who put their hope in His unfailing love. This morning I invite you to put your hope in His unfailing love. You may need to come down and kneel at one of these altars and spend some time with Him and 
tell him, God, I'm sorry that I haven't put my hope in you always. I've tried to find other things. I've tried to fill that void of hopelessness with so much other stuff. I haven't made room for you. Maybe you just need to stand right where you're at with your head bowed and your eyes closed. And you might need to just say to God, God, right here I stand and I tell you I'm sorry because I haven't put my hope in you. But whatever you do, however you do it, you might want to just kneel where you're at in your seats. You might want to just stand here dwelling and thinking about Him. However you do it, before you leave here today, make sure for the lost world and hopeless world's sake, make sure that your hope, the hope that is within you, is in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ alone. Do you like we're going to sing out of the world? Do you like
have Dale's parenting class. You meet at 5 o'clock tonight, and then at 5.30, those of you that are part of our Christmas musical will be rehearsing. This Wednesday night, we'll not have our Wednesday dinners. We will have our Bible studies, the classes that start at 6.30. We're taking a break for our, from our dinners until after the first of the year, but still all of our classes will be meeting on Wednesday night. Go from here this morning with all of your hope in Jesus Christ, the hope of the world. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for you coming to bring hope to this world. As we go from here today, Lord, I just pray that, that we would take uh, the faith that we have and the hope that we have in you, and we would share it with those that are around us. We would tell those who are hopeless where they can find hope that will last for all eternity. Bless us, Lord. Bring people into our lives that need hope so that we can share the hope of Christmas with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.